We're about to have a new friend this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to our podium. Put your hands together for Leah Carson. Thank you. I go to Veg Fest all over the country, and I have to say, this is the most amazing one I've ever been to. The venue's amazing, the selection of food is amazing, the people are amazing, the weather's amazing, it doesn't get better than this. There's one woman that is behind this whole Charlotte Veg Fest this year, and she is utterly amazing. She's the reason why I'm here, and she is gonna be behind the scenes most of the day. She's the president of the Charlotte Veg Fest and why this whole thing is here this year, and it's... Yeah, thank you, Jamika. Okay, I have one request before I get started, which is that I want to take a photo of you all. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, but I need you to stand up. All right, and move to the center. And I want to count to three. I want you to say, go vegan, okay? All right. One, two, three. Go vegan! Yay! All right, thank you. <laughs> Yay! I am the head of Mercy for Animals, and I'm the founder of the Transformation Project. So Mercy for Animals is an organization that is working to end factory farming and transition our food system to a more just, sustainable, and compassionate one. And Transformation is a project where we are working with factory farmers, in fact, many here in North Carolina, trying to transition them out of factory farming into specialty crops. And I've been doing this work for about 25 years now. Probably if you're here, you have some awareness of the harm of factory farming, the way that meat, dairy, and eggs is produced, and how it affects animals and the people and the planet. And maybe you're really morally ambitious too about this. Maybe you already are really eating thoughtfully. You're making choices that are better for your community, better for the animals, and better for the planet. So we're all people who know. We know that the way that meat, dairy, and eggs is produced is really bad. It's bad for ecosystems. It's bad for the people around us. And we won't reach our climate change targets. We won't be able to solve many of our worst problems in the world unless we stop factory farming. However, despite the fact that we know this, we are losing the narrative battle. And what do I mean by that? In 2024, this year in March, there was a poll done on American perspectives of the food system. It was very shocking to me. It turns out that the majority of Americans have a positive or strongly positive view of Tyson and Smithfield. Those are the largest pork and poultry companies in the United States. And Smithfield in this state has been sued drastically for the harm that is done to communities of color, for example, and their, their health and, and their ability to thrive. The story that Americans believe, so they don't just believe that they're neutral, they actually have a good feeling, a positive feeling. 75% of Americans think that Tyson is a good company. And so they're walking down the aisle, you know, and they see the Tyson logo sitting there on a plastic wrap meat. And they look at it and they go, nice. That's a nice company I have good feelings about. And they put that in the cart and they move on with their day. That is what the majority of Americans believe. And that's the story we need to change. We have so much data, so much details on the harm that factory farming does. One third of our arable land is used to feed factory farmed animals rather than ourselves. And there are more greenhouse gas emissions that come out of industrial animal agriculture than planes, trains, and automobiles put together. And the harm that it does to our bodies is causing a public health crisis. So we know these facts, and yet we are losing. The reason is, this is such a difficult idea. It's such a complex idea, factory farming, that we have to tell stories. As human beings, we have always told stories. That's how we change behavior. That's how we change hearts and minds. And so I wrote a book full of stories to provide readers a window into factory farms. So in my book, the reader travels to what is usually so inaccessible. So a slaughterhouse worker's life, a factory farmer's life, an animal trapped in a factory farm. The book is broken into three parts, farmers, 
the animals and communities, and their personal stories, their windows, their personal stories about how each of these beings are affected by factory farming. And so I want to share three of those stories with you. So it's going to be a bit of story time. Some of it is a little bit difficult to hear, and I'm going to edit it a little since there's kids in the room. So I'm going to start with the Haley's. So the Haley family epitomizes the plight of many American chicken farmers. So these chicken farmers live in Texas, and for three decades, they were working for Pilgrim's Pride, which is one of the largest chicken companies in the world. What began as this very promising venture soon showed its true colors. So while corporate executives were reaping in profits, people like the Haley's were caught in a cycle of debt and struggle. And when their father died, his widow, the mother, had to take over running the farm while doing her nursing job because it didn't make enough money to even pay the bills. And in 2007, just when they thought they had cleared all their debts, they were faced with a cruel ultimatum from the company. Invest in costly upgrades or lose your contract. So this is a very familiar pattern to poultry farmers throughout the United States. So the farmer has to purchase all of the infrastructure, the warehouses, the equipment, all of that, and it costs a million dollars. And companies like Tyson and Purdue, they provide the access to the loan to be able to do that. But the only way to pay off that loan, like a mortgage, it's this 30-year mortgage that they have to pay off, is to keep raising chickens, block after block after block. And so they're beholden to that company because if they lose that contract, they can't pay off their debt, and they lose everything. It's very typical that just as these farmers reach financial freedom, the goalpost shifts. So after a decade or two, the standards change, the company comes around and they say, actually, we need you to upgrade your air unit, your computer unit, your feeding unit. And they ask them to upgrade, and if they don't upgrade, they will not renew the contract, and they'll lose everything. So they hold them hostage. For the Haley's, this meant taking nearly a million dollars more out in new debt, which they did. History repeated itself. A decade later, they still owed $130,000. And this time the Haley said, enough. They weren't gonna do it, they refused to do it anymore. And they started looking for something else. And they found my organization, Transformation. And we help farmers, I founded this organization that helps farmers transform their lives. And they went from being indebted poultry farmers to being independent hemp growers, which is awesome. Yes. And in a poetic twist, they also repurposed some of their warehouses to a sanctuary for rescued dogs, because in Texas, there's a lot of kill shelters. And so they would rescue the dogs from the kill shelters, and then they'd rehabilitate them and then rehome them. And a donkey sanctuary, which is like, if you know doggies, they're amazing. And so I want to read just a tiny bit from this part of the book. I had the pleasure of being there with them to harvest the hemp the first time it came up. And it was really a euphoric experience, also because I was covered in hemp oil, which is amazing. It can take two or three tugs from Morgan before the hemp plant comes loose from the soil. Evan clips the roots off each plant as Morgan holds one on each arm each one a heavy lift at four feet in height. Then they throw the whole plant in the back of the pickup truck. The metal long house stands off in the distance. To go from death and destruction, the chicken houses, to growth and creation, the hemp, creates a simple feeling of fulfillment the family has not felt before. The scent of ammonia from the chicken feces is fading as we hang the hemp plants. Soon there is no scent, no sign that the chickens were once here. Slowly the hemp is putting to rest the ghosts of the past held inside these warehouses. There is only an aroma of hemp filling the air, filling our pores, oil sticky on our hands and clothes. Growing something just changes your heart compared to killing something, reflects Evan, as he's finishing up the first day of the harvest. So my book took me all over the country, and it took me to places where factory farming is, which is typically out of sight and out of mind. And it took me to a town in Denison, Iowa. Now, Denison, Iowa, is a town that is entirely made up of people working at a Smithfield pig slaughterhouse. So here, the slaughterhouse is running day and night, filled with 
the blood and guts of pigs, and also the sweat and tears of mostly immigrant women from Mexico, Central, and South America. And I went and met with these women. My father's an immigrant from Colombia. I speak Spanish, and I was able to spend time interviewing them in Spanish. Now, one woman told me that her name is Sandra, that one of the worst issues for them is that the line speeds go so fast. And if only the line speeds could slow down, it would be so much better for these women. She told me that up to 10,700 pigs passed through her hands in one day. One day. She talked about having to hold her bladder for hours and hours, witnessing people urinating on the floor, desperation. In a 10-hour shift, workers are only allowed two 15-minute breaks and one 30-minute unpaid break where they have to take off their equipment and put it back on. And maybe one of the most harrowing stories of all of my research was a woman named Marisol, and that's not her name, I changed it for her protection. And I'm gonna read a little bit, and I'm gonna edit it just a tiny bit because of the kids in the crowd. Marisol also works side by side with Sandra. She often stopped by Sandra's home on her day off with her young children to visit with the abuelos, though they were not family in the strictest sense. When Marisol sat down to talk, the tears swelled almost immediately. Maybe I should not tell you the things I have endured, she said. They are so ugly. A relative had paid for her trip from El Salvador, where she was five months pregnant, and between the violence and the dire poverty, she had to get out of El Salvador for the sake of her future child. And I won't read this part, but she did suffer some extreme harassment on her crossing. And when she finally arrived at the United States, uh, she got her first job. And she had crossed the border without authorization. So she had limited opportunities coming here. Her first job was in the lavada, the cleaning shift of the slaughterhouse. She cleaned guts, but muscle, fragments, fat, and bone from the equipment. It is the very worst job in the slaughterhouse, reserved for those who are truly living in the shadows, including children. And I don't know if you remember, but last year, eight major companies were fined for illegal child labor of children in slaughterhouses at using them at night, and they were fined minor amounts. There were nothing for these companies. Marisol found it unsurprising that there was the widespread use of illegal child labor. She felt that given the lack of rigor in paperwork, the companies would see no difference between her and employing children. The company that oversees the Levada was willing to hire Marisol despite her not having employment authorization. Her job was to use a high pressure hose full of hot water to spray down the equipment. Her hand and wrist burned with pain from holding the heavy hoses. She mixed and sprayed toxic chemicals to sanitize the machine. She'd arrive at 9 p.m. and finish at 6 a.m., which she'd return to her baby, her newborn baby. Now, the book goes on to describe Marisol's abuse and harassment, both at home and the lavada. She ended up having psychiatric hospitalization and eventually left the lavada in search of a new job. And it continues. Unable to take the harassment of the lavada shift any longer, she took a job in a pig factory farm, and the signing bonus allowed her to move into her own place. Finally, she had a place of her own. But to her horror, the work was worse than she could have ever imagined. Here, pregnant mother pigs were kept in crates. After babies were born, Mari Souls was told her job was to kill any of the piglets that didn't meet the standard. I didn't want to, but I had nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. What choice did I have? Now, Marisol's story is that she eventually does get legal status. And as soon as she does, as soon as she gets her legal status, she's out of there. She's not in a slaughterhouse. She's not on a factory farm. She works in a tax office and, in fact, starts a vegan line of makeup, which is amazing. And it really goes to show that factory farming relies on vulnerable people running it in the shadows, who can't vote, who can't speak up, who can't fight for their legal rights. And without those people, it wouldn't function. And I spoke to a lot of people like Marisol. She's one amongst many. Many don't feel like they can speak up. They don't have that privilege, that right. And it's truly heartbreaking to me that our country's cheap chicken nuggets and cheap bacon is on the backs of the extreme suffering of these women. So my third story is a little bit of a happier story, and it's 
about pigs. Who's been to a sanctuary before? Ah, oh, they're the best. So let's turn last but not least to the farmed animals. So human beings as a species capable of moral choices and domination over other beings, unfortunately have overall chosen to be cruel to farmed animals. And I tried to find new ways to tell their story about how the system impacts them. And one way to do that is to go to sanctuaries or even rescue one myself. And in my book, I talk about a chicken that I rescued myself named Henrietta, who became best friends with my daughter. And we are actually doing an animation about her now. So you'll be able to see that soon. Visiting a sanctuary is a real chance to see animals living out their life with full agency, a glimpse into this different world that could be possible. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but often I'm asked, well, what do you want to happen to the farmed animals? Do you want them to go extinct? As if the only choice is them being extinct or extreme cruelty. But if we do stop eating them, what exactly would our relationship be to farmed animals? They're not wild animals. They rely on us, they're domesticated. And so I went to explore not just how meaningful their lives could be, but how meaningful our lives could be if we change that relationship. And so actually I came here to North Carolina to do that. And there's a wonderful sanctuary called Sisu Refuge. Check it out, it's really sweet. It's an entirely pig sanctuary in Duplin County. And Duplin County has the highest concentration of pig farms anywhere in the United States, mostly Smithfield. So it's quite a place to have a pig sanctuary. So Erica and Joseph, their lives took a turn. They lived in Jacksonville, uh, North Carolina, and she was a volunteer firefighter, and he's a soon-to-be ex-Marine. And they, so they were people who embodied community service. And so when Hurricane Florence struck, they naturally went out into their community looking to see who needed help. And they were animal lovers. So as they went out, they were expecting to rescue dogs and cats. But what they got was a bunch of pigs. They found tons of pigs wandering around the neighborhoods. And if you've lived here during Hurricane Florence, I think you probably remember those images. So what had happened is the storm had torn through North Carolina, had torn through factory farms, and it freed any animal that could escape but it tragically trapped all of the female pigs that were in the crates. They couldn't get out and they drowned, but the males got out and they were known as the hurricane boys, as Erica affectionately calls them. And with 44 of those survivors, they started Sisu Refuge. And they were driven by this compassion. They bought this land in Duplin County and they started to get other calls, road accidents and what's known as truck jumpers. So Felix, the pig, was a truck jumper, and he had squeezed through that truck and jumped off the truck while I was moving and ran away, escaped, no doubt trying to get back to his mother. He had just come from a sow farm. And so just to illuminate the harsh reality he came from, now sows endure this cycle of confinement and gestation and farrowing crates, and they're denied their natural instincts. If you have ever seen a pig, they're just like us humans who want to they have a nesting behavior before they have their babies. And if allowed, they will build this tremendous nest and it will be decorated with ferns and flowers and all kinds of things. It's incredible. But in a factory farm, they're denied all of that. They're on a concrete, wet, slatted floor in a crate. And this is what Felix escaped from. He narrowly escaped and he ended up in the arms of Erica and Joseph. And I want to read a little bit from that. In just two weeks, Erica and Joseph took him not only into their home, but into their hearts. He slept in their bed with them. They swaddled him like a baby. They carried him around in a carrier, in a baby carrier, like one of those Bjorn ones, while they went around their business around the house and farm. It felt natural, and Felix did not object. After all he'd been through, he surrendered to the warmth and security of his new family. He had a couple bumps and bruises, but was in pretty good shape. His emotional state was another thing entirely. Erica recalls how depressed he was. He still tried to nurse on whatever, your arm or finger, whatever seemed viable as he desperately searched for his mom. He missed her, but soon he came to love and find comfort and safety 
in his human family. Felix would actually fall asleep in Erica and Joseph's arms. And as Felix grew in confidence and strength, Erica and Joseph felt he was ready to go outside. They had a fenced-in halfway area where they put the pigs in before they went into the larger, freer, forested area. It's right next to their home, so they can keep a close eye on these more vulnerable pigs. Right away, Felix was so social and happy. He met the pot-bellied pigs first because they're small, and they were the welcoming party for new pigs, just beginning life outdoors. Felix got used to other pigs in the backyard before they introduced him to the bigger space. The pigs of the sanctuary are allowed to make their own families, their own friends, their own groups. And Erica tries not to intervene. Felix's chosen family were four pigs named Zeke, Stewie, Pierre, and Penelope. They bonded, Erica recalls. They would sleep together and they would always hang out together, just swim and wallow in the mud. So I've told you three stories today from the impact factory farming has on three different sets of beings. And I think it's really important to remember that fact I told you right at the beginning, that most Americans, they look at a Tyson logo, they look at that plastic wrap meat, and they don't have a negative association, even though all the facts are out there. We have to change the narrative. The data is crucial for informed decision-making, but we need to combine it with powerful stories. We need stories to humanize data and to humanize the impact that factory farming is having or animalize the data that impact that factory farming is having. I told these stories because knowing them, each of us, and my book is full of more stories, enables us to go beyond the data and the numbers to really see, to feel, to know who suffers from factory farming. And it can inspire us to fight with a new collective narrative where factory farming is seen for what it is, which is truly one of the most destructive and cruel systems in human history. And in this, I think we have a chance of changing behavior and changing our future to create a more compassionate future. And I've told these stories today, the Haley family finding redemption in hem, or Mahdi Souls, resilience in an unimaginable heart, hardship and overcoming that, or Felix discovering love in this family with Erica and Joseph. They're not isolated tales. They're glimpses into realities that thousands, in the case of animals, billions suffer. But it's also their story of resilience. And it's a tale of the future we could have where animals are treated with dignity, workers are valued, and farmers can thrive. This book is about perhaps retelling that story to our friends, to our neighbors. So next time when they walk down that aisle, they pass that logo, they pass that plastic wrap meat, and they go, no thanks, I'm gonna choose something else. Because they have that story. We're very much driven much more by our heartstrings than our headstrings. And this book is about inviting people to have a new narrative about how meat, dairy, and eggs is produced. It's a call to action for all of us to tell stories and to try to change that dominant narrative. And the path forward isn't easy, but I certainly believe transformation is possible. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to be over there um, at a table if you want to ask me questions or talk to me afterwards, but I'm so grateful to be here today. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, all. <laughs>